Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I know this event is for both RBI and Red Sox scholars, so for those who don't know who I am, my name is Mick Bloom, and I'm a program specialist with the Red Sox Foundation. Uh, my main focus is our youth baseball and softball programming, so uh, I wanted to welcome all of you to our Red Sox Foundation Speaker Series as we celebrate Black History Month, an exciting time, and we are really excited about this series because we wanted to highlight some amazing individuals uh, in our community who are doing some awesome work. So with that, I will toss it to Lydia to introduce herself and our guest. So for those who don't know me and are not on this call and will be um, viewing this via the recording, my name is Lydia. I am the program specialist and run the Red Sox Scholars Program. Um, so thank you to everyone who, are, who is here today. And I am excited to welcome our guest, Alizar Ayeli. I hope I am not butchering your last name, uh, from Biogen Foundation, um, from Biogen's Cam uh, Cambridge Community Lab. So Alizar has been there for a few years now. Our Red Sox Scholars um, obviously know him and love him dearly. From all the community lab visits they you know often recognize him as one of their favorite science teachers even though they're only with him for one day or twi uh, two times a day in a year. Um, Alizar was actually recently awarded with the inaugural Immigrant Leadership Award for his work around teaching and exposing students to the world of science and STEM career opportunities. Um, so we're excited to hear from him today about how he got started on his journey. Um, so with that being said Alizar do you just mind by um, do you want to just start by telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. Man, it is so great to see everyone. I know that uh, COVID has really struck it hard and this pandemic has not been fun. Um, so my name is Alazar, as Lydia mentioned. Um, I have the honor and the privilege of teaching young people like yourselves for many years. Uh, I'm coming up on year seven. So I've been teaching for seven years and I am still like a 22 year old at heart. So it's okay. Um, because I remember starting this career as a 23, 22, 22 year old. I think I was 22 when I started teaching. Um, and it's been wonderful. Um, so uh, let me give you guys a little bit about an overview of who I am as a person. I think everyone remembers who I am. Um, and then, but before I get to that, I want to ask you guys all a very fun question. Who on this call, all right, who on this call identifies as an immigrant? Who traveled to the United States with their mom and dad? Like years ago. It could have been yesterday. That's okay. But I traveled here uh, when I was a little boy in 1998. All right. Now that that's like a long time ago for some. I don't think you guys were even born at that time. But that was 1998. Now, who identifies as a black or a Latino person? I do. All right. Great. Now uh, there we go. Look at that. I love when the cameras start coming on when you start asking the more fun questions. Now. Who also speaks another language at home? Ah, uh, yeah, that's right. Who speaks like more than two languages at home? All right, I get a chance to do that once in a while if I'm talking to my grandma. Um, so one of the, the reasons I keep asking these questions is because I think when I first came to the United States, the most difficult thing was a few things. One is I've never seen a white person before. So I came to the US and I saw my first white person and it was this girl who sat in front of me, okay? And her name was Sarah and this is first grade in the United States. And the one interaction, I've, I've probably told the story a million times. I have to tell you, I have to keep telling it because it's so, it's so unique. And I remember because I was seven years old and it was a different world for me. So what I did was I took my pen, I remember, or my pencil, because they give you that really big pencil. I don't know why they give you a big pencil in the United States, but that was the first thing I remember is they gave me this massive pencil. It was like a size 10, I don't know. So um, the circumference of the pencil at least. And so I went and just kind of pushed her hair with the pencil and it went back to normal. Now I come from a culture where the hair looks like this. So I gotta actually, can I, can I share my screen? I really wanna show this like really cool video, not video, like a little uh, presentation. Of course. All right. Can you guys all see my screen? Yes, we can. Oh, you're sweet. you're on the not on the presenting mode. If that there you go. Now you are. There we go. Okay, great, great. So I come from people who look like that. All right. Literally, this is like tribal conversations that you guys can all be like, oh my goodness, he comes from. That. I don't really come from that, but like you know, my heritage and my ancestors come from that. Um, but look at our hair. We dye our hair with like you know paint and stuff like that, but our hair doesn't really move unless you move it yourself. And to move it down, 
uh, I have to hold it down for like two days. I have to hold it down. I can't just leave it, right? And it'll, it'll just go back to normal. So that was my very first interaction as an immigrant um, in the United States. And I really love that because it goes back to kind of telling you how every single person comes from different knowledges and different perspectives. But more importantly, you have different interactions. I remember not speaking a word of English. So my mother came, she dropped me off at school. And the first thing I did was I started to swell up in tears. The moment she turned and said, bye. I literally was just like, you're leaving? Why are you leaving? You need to stay here. <laughs> and it's his first grade. And the teacher did not know what I was saying. And I had no idea what she was saying because we just didn't agree because we didn't understand each other. But it's been a long journey from there, okay? Because I, I come from a country and anyone who wants to take a guess where I come from, if you guys remember, anybody, anybody, we love coffee. People look like that. And coffee beans are very special to us. Anybody want to take a guess, write it in the chat. Let's see if I can do, if I can have some fun with it. If you remember what country I come from. And I think Lydia, if you can manage the chat, if they're writing in there. I am looking nothing yet. Come on, guess what country I am from. Oh, we have one person said Colombia. Okay. Someone said Ethiopia. Okay. Any other guess? Any other guess? That those are the two I have. It for those now. are the only two. Nobody else wants to say guess. Come on, there's like 190 countries out there. Come on, at least like one or two more people. Need yeah, to. come on, two more people. Let's have some fun with this. This is going to be an e this is going to be like an evening of fun. All right, there we go. We have chat stuff in here. Okay, there we go. That's oh, fine. Ethiopia again, Somalia. All right. So we have one Colombia, two two Ethiopia, Somalia. Oops, someone just said Ghana. Nice. Okay, so we're going into the West Africa. So uh, uh, I'm going to cut you off there because uh, well, I am. It's already been said. I am from Ethiopia. All right, so I am from the, um, the eastern part of Africa or the Horn of Africa. So you're very close with Somalia and very close with, uh, well, definitely on the spot with Ethiopia. Uh, so we came here and this is what Ethiopia looks like. So Ethiopia is that little orange area there. And we got on a plane in 1997, not knowing what we were doing. You know, my mom and dad were like, we're going to America. Now in my head, we're going to America means we're going, everyone's going to have a mansion. Has anyone ever taught you like in your head, America's like, you know, this best place to be in and all that, right? So um, we got on the plane. I was seven years old. Again, I was seven. So we got on this plane. Um, and then after we got on the plane, it took us like a day and a half or so travel to get there. So we land at Logan Airport and it was brutally cold. I remember how cold it was because I didn't wear a jacket. I just came with like, you know, I came with a long sleeve on. And then the person who was picking us up had brought us all jackets because we're coming in February. So this was like 22 years ago or 23 years ago, whatever. I can't do math. So this was, you know, years ago. And so, you know, we get our jackets. It's brutally cold. I've never been to a country that was so cold because, again, in my entire life, I've always lived in Ethiopia. Seven years of my life I've spent in the heat. If you went outside and you kind of wanted to enjoy the heat, you just went outside. If you wanted to enjoy the cold, you just didn't go. There was no such thing as cold. Cold is like 72 degrees or, you know, 68 degrees at best. So that's where I come from. Um, and then obviously, like all of you, I went to school because, you know, America makes you go to school. And then the first thing that came to my mind was, and, and I forgot to tell you guys this part is, I turned to my mother, what, like the night we got to the U.S., I turned to my mom and I was like, so mom, they have four walls here. When are we going to the U.S.? You know, I asked her, literally, when are we going to America? She said, what do you mean? I'm like, well, they have four walls here. We have four walls there in Ethiopia. Why did we leave? Why did we make such a big change in our lives to come here, right? And so as a seven-year-old, I didn't really get it. But what was amazing is I traveled, right, this long distance. And this is obviously not the distance, right? It's supposed to be the other way. But it's such a long trip and a long haul to get to where I am. But the point is, like everyone else, I went to school. Like all of you, I went to school, like, right? So I went to high school. So I went to middle school, then I went to high school. I really enjoyed it. Like I really loved school. And I don't know why. It was because it came easy, maybe. Um, I remember having interactions. I made friends, you know, I made some buddies. Um, 
and I just kind of went to school. Like, you know, you, you do what you do at school. You learn the language. I remember my third grade teacher who was teaching me English. He was this very old teacher, Mr. Appleyard. And he was so cool, like, you know, teaching me English words. And I was like, all right, new vocabulary word. Every day there was this new vocabulary, new vocabulary word I was learning. And I enjoyed that. Um, and then in kind of high school, I became very good at a sport. And you want to take a guess what sport I was very good at? given that I'm from Ethiopia. I think it's already written on there, right? So it's very good at running. So cross country, track, uh, were my two favorite sports of all time. And I could run for hours and for days, I think. I, I haven't tried days yet, but I can definitely run for hours without a problem. Um, Lydia, should we tell them I ran the Boston Marathon under the Red Sox so yes, so not years only, ago? Yes, yeah, so not only did he run the Boston Marathon, but he actually raised some critical funds for the Red Sox Foundation. Um, and not only that, but you finished in like record timing, I want to say. I, I finished in a very good time, but also considering that year, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did a great job. It was the year, uh, it was the worst year for Boston Marathon. It was hail, there was snow, uh, they, you were slipping and sliding, there were ponchos everywhere when you're running. So imagine running 23 miles, all right? All right, 23, mi 20, sorry, 26.2 miles, 26.2, but the first 23 miles were a disaster because I don't remember after 23 miles. Everything after 23 miles was just a big, you know, just a big blur. Anyways, so running is a thing that I really love. And I love supporting things that involve, you know, people like you and people like me. Um, so I kept running in high school and it was one of my favorite passions. And then I did this thing called Model UN. I was a part of chess club. I was doing these coffee tastings. I love coffee. To this day, I still drink coffee. There's always a cup of coffee somewhere near my desk because it's so important for me to drink coffee. Um, but after I finished you know, high school, I, I realized I needed to go to college. And college was a very important step in my life because that's something that my parents have always been saying, you need to go to college. You need to, whose parents tell them you need to go to college? Let me see by a raise of hands, right? So my parents' first thing was when we came to the US is you need to go to college. And what college do I need to go to? Everyone, come on, take a guess. What college did you all have to go to? Or what college is expected of you? Everyone needs to go where? Harvard. Harvard. There you go, Sophia, right? So everyone literally tells you, you have to go to Harvard. All right. Harvard is the school you have to be at. Um, and so lucky for me, I was not at Harvard. I was at Northeastern, which is just as good, I want to say. Um, so I ended up going to Northeastern. I ended up you know, being a part of great organizations. I built a family there, made some really cool friends. And in those four years, I learned so much about myself. I learned science, which I really love. My curiosity was like, you know, bigger than before. Um, and I really just wanted to just keep learning. And I really loved that. Um, and then I ended up going to um, Harvard for graduate school. So I made it to Harvard at one point or another. All right. I just, so I don't know where my mom is right now, but I hope she's proud of me because I ended up going to get my master's at Harvard. So that's what I did. Um, and it was hard. All of those things are hard. None of these things came easy. I want to tell you all it's not easy. Right. If it came so easy, everyone would do it. That's the first thing. So it wasn't easy. It was very difficult. I remember there were days where I had to study for a very long time. There were times where I didn't understand it. So I would go back and study it and I still wouldn't get it. And I would go back and study it again. I still wouldn't get it. Anyone ever have that? That was me in school, okay? Every step of the way, that's how I always was because the simple structure is I speak another language. So in my head, I have to like kind of think of it in different languages to make it work, all right? And so that was kind of a big struggle for me. And I had to figure out ways to study. And I had to figure out ways for me to actually figure out some of that information. And so I did, and it took time. And so I had to put in a lot of hard work. You know, I don't know what that, that, that meme is that you guys all use is I had to put in work. I literally had to put in work. And so I did, all right? Um, and so in that, in that journey though, what I really loved about myself was also the fact that, and I hate saying the word I love about myself is, but, the fact is I had to go and get summer internships. I had to learn how to work. I had to learn how to talk to people. Um, it's really hard to talk to some people. It's really hard to talk to professors. It's really hard to talk to people about programs and how do you find support? How do you find people who will let you do some work that you're interested in? Uh, and for the first time ever, how do you as an immigrant talk to people about working, right? So um, I was so fortunate to find these different programs in the city of Boston. So. I was working at the Dana-Farber Harvard Cancer Center. So I did a little bit of an internship there. I worked at Mass General for a little bit. 
And then I did some internship at Harvard University's Department of Zebrafish and uh, Department of Biology with Zebrafish. So I did a lot of different cool things that I really liked. And each of them focused on different parts of a biological standpoint, right? So from the CURE program, it was all about oncology and research and oncology. With MGH, again, it was a little bit of oncology, but it involved a lot of mouse work. With Harvard, it was more like zebrafish and stuff like that. Um, and then I had to go to college and kind of do more internships. Internships are ways for you to just open the door to learn something. And that's what I did. I just went out I learned stuff. Was I great at it? I'm going to tell you right now, no. That's not the point of an internship. The point of an internship wasn't for you to be this excellent scientist and leave. It's the point of the internship is for you to taste a little bit of that little work life and see what it's like, see if you enjoy it, and see if you can get something out of it. Because it should be able to drive you, right, to make you a better scientist or if you want to be a scientist or to make you a better person, to learn a little bit about the industry. And that's all I really learned in college, right? And then that's what I learned throughout all of these internships. But I eventually came to Biogen and started teaching. So I started teaching young people like you guys. So I started talking about science and, you know, I was this very cool, hip guy teaching science. Um, yes, I have a lot of swag. All right. Esteban can tell you, where's Esteban? Esteban, do I not have swag? Type it in the chat or say something here, right? I definitely have a lot of swag. So I started teaching science and it was great. I loved what I did. I was teaching you guys science. I was teaching how to fight pet, how to centrifuge because that stuff makes sense to me. But the other part is I was motivating you. And hopefully you guys found a career in science and that's what I've been doing ever since. But nowadays, my career is kind of taking a different shift, right? So as you get older, you start to find that you're taking a different shift. So I did my master's, I have my master's degree from Harvard and now I'm doing my, like another degree. It's called a doctorate. So I'm doing my PhD in what's known as anatomy and neurobiology. Um, and so that's what I'm doing while I'm working. So Biogen actually pays me to work and they also let me go to school that they're paying for because I'm just like, I'm not paying anything and you guys have to take care of it. They were like, okay, fine, all right? So you kind of come up with a deal and you arrange something and that's what's happening, right? So right now I was hoping to be in molecular biology and hoping to be in cellular bio, but I kind of really liked neuroscience. You know what neuroscience is? Anyone know? right? It's the study of like the cells in the brain and how different parts of your brain kind of send signals and information so that your body can do this, right? Or your body can remember information. So that's kind of been my biggest focus. And I love to teach and I still like to research. And so there's a coupling factor of all of this. And you know what? I love it. Um, and I'm making this change while I'm doing my full-time job and enjoying it, right? So my biggest question to all of you before I end up, call, before I end up uh, kind of leaving it up for question and a Q and A is really for you guys to understand that you should have a life motto and that life motto should always revolve around you waking up every morning knowing what you're doing, right? Um, so I always believe in others. I think that was a big part of my career uh, because if no one believed in me, I wouldn't be here, right? Someone believed in me to be here. Uh, whether it was my science teachers who were like, Alzar, your homework assignment is late again. Can you please send it to me? They still wrote my recommendation letter for school. Um, whether it was my guidance counselor who was yelling at me um, up until like 6 p.m. when I was in high school because I didn't submit a college application that was due, you know, the day, the day of, right? Um, but they still believed in me knowing that I had potential to be someone. Um, and so I always go back and always want to say the same thing to others. So I truly believe that all of you uh, have a capacity to end up somewhere. So therefore, I need to believe in you and I need to believe in the fact that you can be a scientist if you want. You can be whatever you want to be in this world, as long as you just know that's what you want. And I believe in you. So that's my one of my mottos. Uh, the other is share what you know. I think um, all of you see people who are adults, like, oh, they do such amazing work and all. Now I'll tell you right now, anyone can do what I do. Any of you can do what I do. It just takes a little bit of what's on that next level, which is hard work. If you work a little bit of extra hours, if you study a little bit, read a little bit more books, if you just have some fun understanding something, right, you'll get there. And then you need to also have faith in yourself. I think we all deal with this confidence thing where we hit ourselves against the wall. We're like, I'm not good enough for anything. And I think it's hard not to believe in yourself because if you don't have faith in yourself, you really can't get anywhere. Um, and 
uh, there was this really cool quote that I read the other day. It's the fact that you can be at the bottom of the pit and the only person who can get you out is I can believe in you all the time and make you smile for a day, but you have to be the one that has to actually get yourself out of that pit and say, I'm going to do the work and I'm going to put in that work and I'm going to share what I know, whether it's on a paper, whether it's math homework, whether it's teaching others and supporting others, but I'm also going to believe in others. So when you do that all together, you become this amazing person that no one, you become this unstoppable person and you can literally do whatever you want. So this is kind of why, why I love my life motto because I truly hold on to it every day. So I hope this encourages you a little bit um, because I think that's the end of my slideshow. And I will leave it to question and answers. And we have uh, just a little bit over uh, some times. I, ha I, I have all night if you guys want. Wow, that was amazing. <laughs> Any questions? Thank you for the round of applause, Jaleel. Um, my question is, what has been like something that has to do with medicine that you wanted to do, but you were like, no, I'm too scared to do it? I don't want to say scared to do it. So, um, the, so I really I like that question, but can I rephrase it and answer it a different way? So I really wanted to be a doctor growing up. I wanted to be like a physician, you know, going in and treating patients, helping people. Um, and then what I realized was I'm not going to be good at that. So that's one. And the reason I wasn't going to be good at it is because I was only going to make an impact on one person. Right? As a doctor, you go into the room for 15, 20 minutes and you're supposed to figure out what's wrong with the person. And then you're supposed to leave that room and write down a prescription. Um, and that's it. Right. I found that to be very good, but at the same time, I was afraid of it. Right. And so I never went that route. Um, and to be honest, it's, it's really hard to go in that direction because there's a lot of schooling ahead and you don't get as much of flexibility as you like. Now I, I have to disclose my fiance, by the way, Lydia, I'm engaged. Uh, my fiance who's in medical school at Harvard medical school is doing an MD PhD and she'll tell you right now, she is loving the position of where she is as a, as a scientist, but as a physician, there's just so much. She literally comes home at like 11 PM every day. And so she's like, it's stressful and there's patients and there's always this, I made the wrong decision. Did I make the right decision? And she's like always panicking about things like that. And for me, that's not, I'm not about that life. So that's, that's the one thing as to why I don't want to go into medicine because I don't like panicking. I'm a very chill, like kind of laid back uh, scientist, quote unquote, because for me, the answer is always going to be there. I just have to solve it. It doesn't have anything to do with someone's life, if you will. It's a great question. Anyone else? I mean, I know like, we love Alizar and he's probably, and I think I spoke to, um, spoke about this earlier, but probably one of the smartest people that I know. <laughs> um, so definitely ask Alizar if you have any questions about his career, about what he does now, about where he wants to go in the future, maybe. Yeah, this is an open forum, guys. Any questions you want? Don't forget, you have to unmute yourself to speak. Well, yeah, all your oh, Esteban, go ahead. Yeah, so as a high school senior and as someone who's about to go into college and, you know, uh, try to figure out what I want to do with my life, I was just wondering how you figured out what you wanted to do with your life, how you went down that path and how you got there. All right, dude. By far the easiest question of the night. Um, I've always had this curiosity thing. So uh, can I share a story? Is that okay, Esteban? Yeah, go ahead. All right, sweet. So when I was seven, six, six years old, this is back in Ethiopia. Um, my dad used to travel a lot. Um, he never took his kids and I still resent him for that because um, he used to go to Japan, he used to go to Amsterdam, he used to do all these really, really cool trips. And he used to work on this massive um, ship basically where they imported goods into the country. Um, so that's what my dad used to do. Um, and I guess one time he went and he brought my mom a really cool watch. So um, he brought her this really cool watch, a really nice, again, 
gold watch. So I used that gold watch because I don't think it was really gold. But um, he gave her this beautiful gift. Um, and as a kid, I was always curious as to what made things work, right? Uh, so if you guys are a big fan of podcasts, I don't know if you guys listen to podcasts or not, but there's this really cool podcast called How It Works and realized that that was like a really cool thing to actually listen to. Um, but um, the reality was at six, I remember my dad giving my mom this watch. Now, as a kid, you're curious. You want to know why things work. So I picked up my, my mom's watch and would put it on my ear and it would tick. So my first question was always, what made it tick? What makes this clock tick? Um, and so my mom was like, oh, it's, you know, it's a little thing that's in there that makes it tick. And in your head, what are you thinking? I got to know. I have to know what makes it tick. And so this is, again, my six-year-old brain, okay, wanting to figure out what made things work. So I took that watch uh, one night when she was in the shower, and I took it to the yard and I just smashed it into pieces with a rock. Um, now, I was not in the United States, so I, I it was okay that I got a whooping, but I got a nice whooping, all right? But the reality was, I've learned something about that watch. It has these little tiny gears in it that made it move. And somehow, some way, when you wind that gear, it will tick, right? And so you, do, do you see what I'm getting at, right? So your childhood curiosity is something that I think I carried all the way up until now. Um, and that ability and that desire to want to know something. So um, this is a time for you to start to reflect. You don't have to have everything figured out either. So as a senior, I know you're going to get senioritis in just about a month or so. The moment you start to hear back from schools, you're going to start putting your foot up and it's about it. Use that time to also reflect on what you want to do. Use that time to say, what was I good at as a kid? What keeps me awake at night? Because if it's not worth keeping you awake at night, then it's really not worth doing. For me, curiosity and why things work and how things are detailed and intricate kept me awake. So now I'm on this other adventure where I'm in literally studying the neuroscience of a brain and the pathways of brain science and all that. And it keeps me awake. I literally lose so much sleep at, at a time, but there's nothing more that keeps me like rejuvenated and excited to see a new publication that came out or some scientist is fighting another scientist. And believe it or not, if you guys think there's like this beef between LeBron and, um, you know, Kobe or, you know, way back when with Kobe, like guys get ready for it. All right. Cause in science, it's a whole different battlefield. Cause there's literally one, one scientist who will fight against one particular topic. And, you know, there's, there's, there isn't explicitly memes because they're not like that kind of famous, but they're famous in the world of neuroscience. So you're seeing these things battling it out, but it's all data driven. It's all, and I hate saying it, it's all nerdy. All right. So that's what I really, that that's what really keeps me awake. And especially when they post, you know, coming live next week, um, we'll be publishing our paper. You're just like, oh, I cannot wait until this day because you spend your Friday night like waiting for that paper to be published because that's what you end up reading. And my fiance and I are fighting over a piece of paper that probably could be disproved next year, but that's really where we are. Um, so what keeps you awake at night? Really answer those questions and use the time to reflect to address that because if you're more passionate about it, you become really good at it too. You're making me think my life decisions. <laughs> Um, Tashinia, I saw that you had your hand raised earlier. Was you, you're good? Okay. And Mick, I think you have a question. Yeah, well, we have one from in the chat. Uh, Alzar, what's the hardest thing about doing what you do? Time management. Learn how to do that early. Um, school does not do you justice with time management. Like they don't teach us about time management in school, do they? Right, right, right. Okay, great. So the hardest part of it is time management. Honestly, if you can manage your time effectively, um, I think that's going to make you very successful. So um, my experiments will take me two hours. One particular uh, work will take me about an hour and a half. Um, emails can take me 30 minutes. But if you don't manage your time, all of these things can blend in and it can just be a big time sucker because by you know 10 p.m. you're up responding to emails you could have responded into it with two words, right? So learn how to manage your time. There are ways to do that as well. And I think as young people, it's like telling you that you need to manage your time is unfair. It's really unfair. But I think as young people, learn how to do that. Learn how to prepare to expect how to manage your time. Um, so that I think is the hardest part of what I do. 
Um, but the other part of it is, um, you know, just putting in the work. I think putting in that time to actually do work is important. So make sure you guys are doing that as well. Awesome. Well, we'll, we'll take any last questions if anyone has any. Well, Elzar, we are getting up on, on time, but thank you so much for taking the time to chat with all of us. Um, we, we cannot thank you enough sharing your story. I have been around the foundation for a while and I obviously have gotten to know you a little bit, not as much as I hope, I, I hope to. So hopefully in the future, all of us can get to know you even more. Um, and, and it's been amazing having you join us this tonight. Um, so thank you. Okay. No worries. Thank you so much, Mick. Thank you, Lydia. Um, students, you guys are welcome to have my email. Lydia has it. So feel free to, you know, get access to that if you guys have any other questions or anything like that. Other than that, enjoy the rest of your school year. Uh, stay strong. It is a pandemic. So I have nothing else to add other than the fact that, you know, wear your masks and wash your hands and take care of yourselves and your families. Thank you so much.